I just realized that I have even genders on my team members, that's interesting. But anyway, welcome back to Pokemon XD. Last time we cleared out what I like to call Area 2 of Citadel Isle, now it's time to move on to the third one. The third one, which is... The Lava Area. And our protagonists are totally fine here. Also... Doddle with Syphet! That's all I'll say there. Oh, right, okay, we're supposed to be down with Cypher. So, yes, it's Egan, and he's sending his first email, and, um, it's cut off. I should mention, unlike in Coliseum, the cutoff email doesn't actually imply anything. If you go all the way back to Agate Village and talk to him, he won't have any new item for you or anything like that, so there's actually no point in leaving now. So... We have here this suspicious looking white cube that's positioned precariously on a cliff over the lava. Let's see what happens if we push it. Down it goes. And for some reason, blocking off the flow of lava instantly causes the remaining lava to cool and harden into rock that's cool enough to walk on. Because Pokemon logic, yeah. Anyway, that lets us get this item. That's going to be how this area works, and I actually like how it's laid out. That first block there, I'd like to call an example of a video game anti-piece. This is basically a wordless tutorial. So the way it's introduced is, you have that white block there that looks suspiciously interactable, because it looks quite different from the rest of the, the terrain in the area, and it's placed over a cliff above lava, so the player is naturally inclined to walk forward and try and push it. That way, they'll find out that you can push the blocks, they fall into lava, and when they do so, they block off the flow of lava and cause um, it to cool down and enable you to walk on that area. This one required two of them. So, in a way, it's giving you a tutorial to this puzzle's main mechanic without actually telling you, like, oh, you can push these blocks and they will block the lava flow and make it safe to walk on. It's kind of cool, and you don't often see RPGs using anti-pieces like that. It's really common in platformers, not so much in RPGs. But anyway, I just thought I'd like to discuss that, I guess, a random game design lesson. But anyway, going over here, we have another block coming up, which we can push down. And this one will form a platform that we can walk over while also cooling down some of the lava over there, which will let us go back and get an item. So, I'll go back down and do that. You might notice we haven't run into any trainers in this area. This is another one of those more puzzle-focused locations, except that will change. So, this, like, concept of pushing the blocks to block the lava, well, one, it's similar to Blackthorn, Gym, and Gold and Silver, but two, it's actually not used that much outside of here. Also, for some reason, I find it hard to get down this slope. But anyway, this lets us get to this item, and we get two white herbs. That's kind of weird, they restore lowered stats. They are mainly useful in competitive play, where the item is restored to you after every battle. Because if you try to use it during the main story, it's completely consumed after one use. So I wouldn't recommend using it during the main story, basically. So, we have a battle coming up. It focuses mainly on fire types, which is why I have this lead. Let's do this. I have no idea what that guy was hanging on to, but it's battle time. I guess you could say a heated battle is unfolding in the... This isn't exactly a Colosseum. Fun fact, there's actually unused location data in the game. Well, it's not actually data, it's more just a description. But for a place called Dark Colosseum, and the description just says, A Colosseum on Citadel Dark Isle. Now, later on in this area, it should be obvious what that unused description refers to, but I thought I'd just mention that because uh, it's another one of the very, very few elements of unused content in this game. Now, I'm guessing that Ninetales is going to use Dig, because pretty much every Ninetales so far has done that, so I'm going to go for a Helping Hand boosted, uh, boosted Water Pulse just because I want to get rid of the Houndoom quickly because it's resistant to Flareon and Shadow Ball, so I won't be able to double target it that efficiently. Well, I guess Helping Hand wouldn't have been useful there. So, there goes the Houndoom. And what do you got next? Vile Plume. Well, that's not exactly a fire type, but it does benefit from Sunny Day, which he's using. Okay, bad news is that lowers the power of my, uh, my Water Pulse. Good news is that I can completely obliterate that Vile Plume now. Or I could just... Yeah, in this situation, I'm just going to do... Actually, Ninetales has good special defense, but bad physical defense. Now is probably the right time to be using 
Double Edge. I wonder if a Helping Hand Double Edge could actually finish that thing off. For now, though, I think I'll just try and Fire Blast the Vile Plume. Helping Hand and Double Edge might have actually one-shotted. They actually probably would have one-shotted. But I kind of want to get rid of that, and I totally called you doing that. Oh, yeah, definitely want to get rid of that Vile Plume. Uh, that might be Fish Slayer instantly gone. No, not quite, but... Still not good, and I'm actually glad that Vile Plume moved first, because otherwise it would have recovered its health. Well, not that it's going to survive a Sunny Day Boosted Fire Blast in the first place, but still. Vile Plume is down, what's going to come out next? Magmar! Haven't seen one of those before. And it's a Shadow Pokémon, so another Gen 1 version exclusive, and another kind of weird Pokémon. Speaking of version, well, I don't know, I always found Magmar to be kind of weird. It did gain a pre-evolution and an evolution later, which made it a little bit more notable, I guess, but even then, I... I don't know, I just never really found it to be all there. You are faster than Ninetales, aren't you? Yes, you are, so there's no real reason for me to keep you in. I'm gonna go ahead and you... Uh... So here's the thing, Ricky's actually gonna be helpful here, because... These Pokemon that he's going to be sending out, even though they are, well, one of them is of a type that is super effective against, um, against Ricky, it's not going to matter because, well, Shadow Pokemon is super effective against everything anyway. But, yeah, even with its evolution, though, I don't really find myself using Magmortar all that much. I mean, in theory, Magmortar is kind of a decent Pokemon, but I don't know, I've just never found it as interesting as Electivire. I don't know, I, it, you, it could be decent in, because I think in Platinum, you... Okay, then... Didn't even go for Flurry on there. In Platinum, you could obtain it kind of early-ish. So it's a good choice for a fire type. I'm so glad they added more fire types to the regional decks in that game. Uh anyway. But here comes a Pokemon that is not a fire type. It is Pinsir. And Pinsir is yet another Shadow Pokemon. So this guy has two blue or leaf green or green, if you're from Japan, version exclusive, which is kind of cool. I guess that's a good thing for me, because since I had red version growing up, I never even knew what Pinsir and Magma looked like in their Gen 1 sprites. Like, because I didn't have... Well, okay, so the first person that I had to trade with was my sister, and she had yellow. So I had no access to blue for pretty much forever. So I... D like, Pokemon like Magma and Pinsir were... I don't know, they were kind of almost mythic proportions to me when I was a kid, because I could never even see them. Now, speaking of which, that pincer is a major threat. It has Shadow Break, and it has a lot of attack, so I'm going to just go for a netball and see if I can catch it right off the bat, because getting it off the field as early as possible will probably be helpful. But I don't really count on this in this it's full health. One, two, three... No, almost, but no. It is a Safari Zone Pokemon and a semi-rare one at that, and I think it's also a bug catching contest Pokemon in Gold and Silver. So somebody's gonna be eating an extremely powerful Shadow Break. Please don't be Ricky, please don't be Ricky, please don't be Ricky, please don't be Ricky, please don't be Ricky. It was Ricky, of course it was. Ah, that's annoying. So yeah, this pincer hits I guess from the gates of fainting I stab at thee or something? That's actually very good, and I'm probably going to chuck another netball right now. I was thinking that I have to use Lyra, but actually, no. I, I've i kind of got this in, well, not in the bag yet, but almost. I'm going to go for another netball. And, okay, yeah, there is actually another Bug-type Shadow Pokemon that's coming up, so I might want to restock my netballs at some point. I will have to go back and, um... Purify a bunch of Pokemon from the Purify Chamber later. One, two, three. Pinsir gets. Though its level is a little low for this point in the game, Pinsir is going to be pretty useful while it's still a Shadow Pokemon. Because of all the Shadow Break users we've had so far, it hits the hardest by far. A base 120 attack stat combined with a 75 base power move that's always super effective, that's a pretty nice combination. Other than that, Pinsir's best stat is in its physical defense, although its HP isn't great. It also has not the best speed in the world, but not awful speed either. So Pinsir is overall straightforward. It hits hard and is kind of bulky. Its ability also keeps it safe from Intimidate, which is nice. 
Its starting moveset after it's purified, though, is a little bit iffy in my opinion. I mean, False Swipe is nice, especially with as much attack as it has, but it doesn't have a status move to back it up. Submission isn't the best fighting type in the world, unless it's Gen 1, which this isn't. And while Helping Hand is a great XD exclusive move, personally I feel it's better on supportive Pokémon, because giving up Pinsir's turn sacrifices a lot of damage potential. And it also replaces Shadow Break with Guillotine, which in my opinion is a major downgrade. And if you're thinking that you can use the Call command to raise your accuracy, one hit KOs ignore accuracy modifiers in Gen 3, so no you can't. For other moves, if you don't like Submission's accuracy or recoil, you can pay the move relearner to get Brick Break or teach it by TM. And Pinsa does learn Swords Dance by level up eventually, which is nice because not many Pokemon in this game do. For other moves, Pinsa makes pretty good use of Bulk Up thanks to its good defense, and you've also got your standard physical attacking fare, Earthquake, Return, Rock Tomb, and your Bulk Standard stuff by Move Tutor 2. You might notice something that seems conspicuously absent from Pinsa's move pool though. This is in my opinion the biggest downside of Pinsa in Gen 3, and part of why its brother Beetle is considered a lot better in that generation. Apart from Fury Cutter by Emerald Move Tutor, Pinsa does not learn a single bug type move in Generation 3, period. Not even by breeding. I wish I was making this up, but I'm not. It's actually true. Believe me, I was just as shocked as you were when I looked up its Gen 3 learn sets. So this Pinsa will never gain the benefit of same type attack bonus ever. And we're getting some other Bug-type Shadow Pokémon soon that don't have this problem. I'm not saying Pinsir is bad, but you'll probably want to use it exclusively as a Shadow Pokémon, because by the time it'll likely be purified, you'll have access to better bug options. Glad to have that thing gone, because, yeah, the Shadow Break coming from Pinsir is extremely painful. But yeah, putting the pins into sleep kind of reminds me of the bug catching contest in Gold and Silver. The annoying thing was that, from what I remember, if you actually put a Pokemon to sleep, you were judged very, very harshly in the judging portion. It was best to catch Pokemon at full health and unstatus, so that was a pain sometimes. But yeah, Pinsir and, uh, please don't crit. Okay, that wasn't a crit. Wow, that did half. Yeah, I am not hitting you anymore. Good thing this thing is going to get much better from the sun, because it has no fire moves, technically speaking. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and rest and sing. But... Pinsir and Scyther were usually the Pokémon that score you the most points in the bug catching contest. Apparently, if you get a shiny, you're almost guaranteed to win, but I've never seen anyone do that. Like, I mean, there's, um, there's this NPC who's pretty memorable for saying, I've heard someone won with a Caterpie. I'm pretty sure the only way you can win the bug catching contest with a Caterpie is if it's a shiny. Because, like, I, I have tried, believe me, I've tried to win with a Caterpie, and I'm pretty sure it's not possible unless it's shiny. But I think that if you, because again, I've never seen or heard of anyone doing this, but I think that if you do get a shiny in the bug catching contest, it's essentially an auto win. Which makes perfect sense, because, you know, like, it's a 1 in 8,000 Pokemon, so why wouldn't they give you an auto win for that? Unfortunately, when I think of the bug catching contest now, I think of the absolutely disastrous occurrence Maryland had in one of his Nuzlocke's there, but I don't want to spoil that for people who haven't watched that yet. One, two, three, Magma gets! While there are a lot of other good fire types available before Magmar, and in fact, if you went for Arcanine earlier, it actually has better stats than Magmar in every single area, don't completely discount it, as it has a few things going for it. Magmar is built as a mixed attacking fire type that has kind of decent speed, but not really amazing, and decent attack and special attack as well. Its special defense is alright, though it is quite frail on the physical side. One of the biggest assets this Magmar has is its starting moveset is actually very, very good. Fire Blast, Cross Chop, and Thunder Punch are all great moves. Remember, Thunder Punch is special in Gen 3, and it helps cover water types that would otherwise destroy you. 
As an XD exclusive move, Magma actually has one we haven't seen before. Yeah, this late into the game. Follow me! This forces all opposing Pokemon to target you for that turn. It's normally a great move in doubles, although Magmar's very low physical defenses let it down in that department. Still not bad though. The other main asset that Magma has over, say, Arcanine is that it actually has a pretty decent move pool on both sides of the spectrum. You have the option to learn Flamethrower by either level up or by TM if you don't like the shaky accuracy of Fire Blast, you can also teach Sunny Day via Move Relearner if you want to save the TM for someone else, and you eventually get Confuse Ray, though I'd rather focus on attacking with Magmar. For TMs though, Magmar learns some pretty interesting moves from both sides of the spectrum. Iron Tail and Brick Break for physical, although I'd probably rather stay with Cross Chop, and Psychic for special. Its tutor moves are unfortunately nothing special. So while overall Arcanine has better stats than Magmar, Magma does make up for it to some extent by having a much better move pool for a mixed attacker. So, two more Shadow Pokemon under our belts, and that's two more Gen 1 version exclusives. That's another interesting thing about, about XD, is that it gives you Fire Red and Leaf Green exclusives. Actually, not just that, it also gives you, like, Ruby, Sapphire, and Emerald exclusives from all sides of the spectrum. Also, I'm not going back to heal because... There's a healing machine here, thankfully. So, that's nice to know. And if I personally was designing this dungeon, I would put Snattle's fight in the next room. But that's not the case. I said earlier, but we have a long way to go before the next boss fight. Also, thankfully, this guy's girl isn't a ceiling peon. She's just standing waiting for us, so... Yeah, also, she does not have any Shadow Pokemon, so I don't need to worry about using Ricky. What is it with Cypher Peons and hitting on you? It's ridiculous! So, Cypher Peon Kim Lee. That's almost a normal name. Oh, right, I remember you. You're the Intimidate Spammer. So, this is a double Intimidate. Physical attackers are kind of going to have a bad time here. Well, I would say that Levitine would, but I've uh, gone mix on Levitine only because I have no other choice because Flareon's move pool is that bad. I will say though, Lever okay, even though Levitine has had some bad luck lately, I will say I actually have been quite impressed with Levitine. I Levitine for a Flareon has actually been not bad over the course of the game. Like, I know that Jolteon and Espeon are probably objectively the two best evolutions for XD with Vaporeon being only slightly behind, but still, like, I haven't had that bad of a time using Flareon, and that's primarily due to Fire Blast, because it's probably the best of the Relgum Tower TM moves for Evolutions, because Jolteon is stuck with Thunder, which has much worse accuracy. Well, I say much worse because, for some reason, yeah, 85% tends to hit a lot more than 70%, and then... Uh, this could potentially be bad, because Zangus does get kind of hard, but anyway. And then uh, Vaporeon really gets no stab move from that, except it kind of has to make do with Blizzard, which isn't even stab, and also has worse accuracy. Uh, and then Espeon, obviously, later on gets Psychic from the Snagum Hideout, which makes Espeon amazing in the main story in this game, but I generally don't like using it, because I've generally played Colosseum before this game, and... Oh, hi there, Mirror Mash. And yeah, you already used Espeon and Umbreon there anyway, so I prefer to avoid those two here. Yeah, Crush Claw is kind of painful, and... Uh, oh, hey, it didn't actually drop defense. 50% chance of a defense drop on Crush Claw, so if you do get hit by it, don't curse your bad luck if you get a defense drop. It's actually pretty likely. And at least that's a level up for Levertine here, so that's... Good, although I don't really have much of an answer to this Sharpedo with what I... Ah, oh, dang it, I've pretty much got to keep Levertine in, although... Now, I was about to say this Sharpedo is unlikely to have Grass Boost, but I really shouldn't say that, because XD trainers tend to have uh, pretty good moves. They usually have TM moves and sometimes even Egg moves, so I really shouldn't be underestimating them. Sadly, no mirror match for you. Fish Slayer is just not a good matchup in this situation. The best option I have is Double Edge, and um, I don't want to recall myself to death. Well, I guess there's Crunch. 
I do like the way that Sharpedo kind of spins around, almost like an actual torpedo or even a submarine. I don't care that you've planted your roots because you will soon be destroyed! Also, yeah, Return is going to do more, and I have no way of avoiding the rough skin, so there's really no other... Yeah, this sharp head doesn't seem to have much in the way of... Wow, that barely did anything! I didn't intend to make a pun there. And there goes Fire Blast missing again, so now it's back to the 50% accuracy that I tend to have with Fire Blast all the time, which is why I personally don't use Fire Blast in competitive. Because I just do not have the requisite luck to do that effectively. Congratulations! You've just sealed your fate even more. Don't you just love it when grass types in this game do that when you have a fire type on the fields? So, um, hopefully this is goodbye, Sunflora. And it's goodbye, Sunflora. Because, like, short of a focus band, there's no way that it could possibly survive that. And obviously it didn't have a focus band or anything like that, because that would be really weird. And hey, there's another level up, so Lyra's the only one who's lagging behind here? Getting some pretty nice stats on our Pokemon, too. The battles here are a pretty good source of experience. <laughs> I can seriously, I can just imagine Master Greeble's voice coming over the PA system saying, Yes, I did see that, and you're fired. Then I'm also ready to be purified. I get the feeling that I'll be seeing more of that um, quite quickly, because, like I said, I've got pretty much the full... Um, you know what? I should check on the, how the Purify Chamber is going with my PC. Speaking of which, at the moment, I do have all nine sets at maximum tempo. So, that's something that's already done, because I will be needing that later in the game. Let me just quickly look at this. Oh, okay. Um, only one of them is finished. So, I don't need to go back anytime soon. For now, though, let's go up this elevator and continue. I, I, I still consider this the lava zone. Because, as you can see, we're still in a bit of a lava area. Now, this area is a troll. Oh, also we get an email from Egan. He has written a haiku poem. If Team Snagum goons cause trouble in the desert, go and sandbag em. <laughs> yes, um, contracting words to fit the syllable count. This room, like I said, is a troll. If you're only concerned with the bare minimum that you need to do in this game, this room is very short. All you need to do is take this path. However, I like to fight everyone. So yeah, get ready for a lot of fights without much in the way of story progress. I am so sorry, but yeah. It has to be done. So this path here is not required, and she's not even going to challenge you. You can just go ahead and grab this two high potions, which is actually kind of worth it. But let's just challenge her anyway. I do find it kind of weird they put this trainer in here and you're not even required to fight them if you go this way. This is just for more experience, but I want the experience because I'm gonna need to... So yeah, I came into this place at like level 36 to 37. You're expected to be 50 by the time you end this place. That is how packed full of trainers this place is. And I just said this place a lot. But yeah, that is how packed full of trainers it is. This is not a good matchup for Ricky at all. In fact, I'm going to preemptively switch Ricky out because I don't want you to get hit by Gust. Even though Gust is a terrible move, it's four times super effective, so I don't want to risk it. Yeah, Flying is one of those types that just wasn't that great in this generation. The best flying move available, well, I mean, Fly and Sky Attack both had major downsides, so, like, the best neutral flying move available really was, um, Hidden Power Flying, when you think about it. And so, failing that, you've just got Wing Attack or Aerial Ace. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, I thought that would be the case, and that was not the one that I wanted to get hit by that. Kind of lopsided levels on you there. But, let's see, I'm gonna go for, yeah, I'm gonna give it a Thunderbolt, as Lieutenant Surge would say. Ah, uh, yeah, I guess I can just Shadow Ball the Sun Floor. Uh-oh, please don't fall for the stupid, sexy Beautifly! Well, I mean, I guess it does have Beautiful in its name, so... Oh, no. You don't physical silver win the ones you love, Beautifly. Stop that right now. You don't get an everything stat boost in front of the ones you love when you are trying to kill them. Stop that now, Beautifly. That's a weird sentence, but it had to be said, and yeah, this isn't good. This is not good. 
That's also not exactly a good move on your part, though. I'll take that. No crit there. Oh, but a crit there, but it still did barely anything. Uh, you know what? I'm just gonna go and... <sighs> yeah, I'm gonna use your turn to heal, because I don't want to run the risk of you... Like, really, I should have focused down the Shadow Ball on the Beautifly, now that I think about it, because that would have instantly got... LOVE TRIANGLE! Again, you don't flirt with another female in front of the one you love, Beautifly. Please stop that. This has just been the craziest battle ever, hasn't it? Well, not exactly the craziest ever, but it's been a fairly crazy battle. <laughs> a ghost cyclops and a, um... Um... Humanoid-looking eldritch spirit that is definitely not human, given its egg group. Um, have both fallen for a butterfly. <laughs> that sounds like a really, really bizarre fanfiction prompt that I don't want to see. Please don't do that. Uh, this is, this is weird. This is very weird. Please end this battle now before I go in. Thankfully, you're not, you have not fallen for the butterfly's charms. But yeah, I kind of want this battle to end just so I can get the weird images out of my head. Uh, this is silly. What? Well, the Beautifly has clearly decided that he doesn't care for Lyra anymore, and just wants to get rid of her. However, the Beautifly has got more than he's bargained for, because now, uh, this guy is like, Hey, 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 stop looking at our team member that way, and he's gonna smash this thing's face in. Um, thus continues the ridiculous fanfiction story. You know, just for fun, I'm gonna do this. It deserves it. Oh, and you're going for Helping Hand as well. This has just been a really bizarre battle, hasn't it? Okay, good. You are not falling for its charms either. And that'll be the last time anyone falls for your charms because Helping Hand boosted max power returning your face. It would have been amazing if that was a crit too, but I'll take that. And now a bunch of people get experience thanks to that whirlwind. Oh no. Oh no. My mind just thought up a pun and I'm not going to say it. Um, yeah. Anyway. Uh, I could have made that the video title if it weren't for the fact that I definitely want to call this part, and I decided on calling it this um, right from the beginning. I really wanted to call this part Dunnel with Siphent. Hello there, best non Mega Horn bug move in Gen 3. Still not all that impressive. Also, it's physical, not. If you get the Everything Snap Boost 2, I'm going to be um, not exactly mad, I'm just going to be confused. Okay, that didn't happen. That would be funny if it did happen. That would have just been a perfect cap off to this battle. Well, that was a crit. I'm, I'm imagining that the opposing trainer here is just as confused as Seppi is at this point. They're, like, they're just like, what is going on here? I just asked for a null battle. I did not ask... Stop dragging this out, please. Now the battle is going to be over, but, but only after you tail glow, because you just had to get that in, didn't you? There we go. So ends one of the silliest battles I've ever had in this entire playthrough. That was... I'm glad that I got that on camera, because that was amazing. That was... That was really amazing. Thank you so much, Chase and Nalax, for that. Not angry at all. I'm glad that I got to witness that hilarious battle. <laughs> I still love that line, though. She's like, I'm standing in this dead end for no reason. Someday I will disappear for no reason. Now, if you... Also, barely anyone took down... Oh, actually, that's partly because I healed, but still. I guess I'll fight you. And this guy does automatically challenge you if you go this way. And you might think that because there's a force trainer battle this way, that's the right path. It's not. That's a red herring. Oh, okay, this is the battle that I'm glad that I have Lyra for, except that Fortress is not going to be that good of an opponent here, but it doesn't matter because I'm going to obliterate that Weezing with Lyra. Lyra, get your revenge for that previous battle. Also, that's a great ability to trace, but it's not going to help now. Um, let us show you can that metal walnut thing. Oh, 
And that is complete and utter overkill. But I will take that. Because Lyra is clearly angry after what happened to her in that last battle. Oh no. Uh, I, I knew someone in here had a Wobbuffet, but... Yeah, I guess it's time to begin once again. Operation Ignore the Wobbuffet. Because, yeah, Wobbuffet cannot hurt you if you don't hurt it. When I was practicing this area, something kind of funny happened. I happened to have Skahar locked in against that. So what I ended up doing was, I ended up using Curse. And then just using Call the rest of my turns. Because... And just waiting for Curse to slowly knock out the Wobbuffet, which weirdly enough took five turns, not four, even though Curse is supposed to do exactly a quarter of their max HP. But I just passed all my turns with Core while it just slowly got fainted by the Curse. That was a pretty funny way to beat that Wobbuffet, and a nice way to avoid um, the risk of Count on Miracle. Ah, perfect! I can now just Muck Punch you. How many other Pokemon do you have? Okay, good, I won't automatically redirect into the Wobbuffet, so I can safely aim that at you and go for Mark Punch. I will say, I don't know, I felt like Ricky has been a bit less useful later in the game, only because it's now that his speed has started to really show. Ugh, it would be great if I'd be using Thunderbolt here, but anyway. And, yeah, you sort of need faster status users at this point. If anything, that Raticate, I, I kind of feel like I should have given it more credit. The Raticate, it potentially can use a combo of Super Fang and Thunder Wave, which is kind of nice on um, a catcher at this point. And it's decently fast, too. Like, it's 91 base speed, I think, so... Not all that slow, and for main story purposes, that speed is pretty good. There's not that much that's going to outspeed it. Okay, this is not really going to matter that much, but I might get lucky and it'll be fully paralyzed while going for a counter, so that'll be nice to go for. Now, let's give it a Thunderbolt, but I won't say that again. Yeah. This is unfortunate. I have something locked in that can't actually hit it for non not very effective damage, except with False Swipe, and that's bad because, yeah, False Swipe is, um not going to be able to KO it, please don't. I did get lucky, that's good. So, this battle is now over. So that battle went by a lot quicker than the other one. It's much smoother. And there goes Wobbuffet. And there goes Ricky's level 37, he's now level 38. Actually, speaking of speed, I want to check something. Lyra, for some reason, despite having, like, 15 points of base speed above Flareon, has actually been speed-tied or slower than Lavatine for most of this playthrough. So, either Lavatine has a really good speed IV, or Lyra has a really bad one. See, look, 68 speed, and Lyra has... 68! Exactly equal! That should not be happening! Lyra's base speed is a lot higher, so... And... Uh, is Sassy minus speed? I, I think Sassy is actually minus special... No, Sassy is plus special defense, I think. Actually, no, wait, Sassy, I think, is minus speed. Now I think about it, I am pretty sure Sassy is minus speed. Because I do remember that the two, like, useless natures are um, the ones that raise one defense and lower the other, because why would you ever want that, seriously? Um, they are... Lonely and gentle. No, not lonely. Pfft, lonely is plus attack minus defense. I was I was thinking of stack attack, and that's why I was thinking lonely. Then no, um, lonely and lax are the two useless natures. Kind of like those lights there. But anyway, we've got a few more non-required battles to go here, and I guess I could give Skahar a little bit more attention. And um, does Ricky need... I think Ricky is the most recent one, too. Oh, yeah, and Ricky's got the amulet coin. I completely forgot that I even had the amulet coin on anyone. But it's time for a few more battles. This guy is challenging you by force. I think you're making a huge mistake if you think you can battle us with that incident. Let's go. Ryder Kooling. Sounds like a weird form of energy drink. I don't know. As a Maryland... That is not the best matchup for Ricky. Again, it's one that I kind of want Lyra for, so I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to switch Ricky out immediately. Uh, 
Like, there's no point in me using Icy Wind because they're both going to be slower than, well, I mean, they're hopefully both going to be slower than Lyra. We'll see. Also, Skahar is going to learn Will-O-Wisp very soon, so I won't be able to get much use out of Curse at this point. I kind of wanted to show it on that Wobbuffet, actually, but, um, hello there, useless ability. And that reminds me of Xenoblade 2, and, uh, yeah. Ugh, I was locked out of so many side quests because I didn't have Keen Eye. You have no idea how frustrating that was. It's just like, like I, I, I get to this point and then I just go through and I'm like, seriously, none of my 50 plus generic blades have either Fortitude or Keen Eye. Although I think I've heard that those two are, like, you can't ever get those abilities on generic blades. They're restricted to unique ones. But anyway, I'm going to talk more about that game because I'm still playing it and I don't want to invite spoilers. So, goodbye Pelipper. Even with the light screen up, you are not surviving a double super effective attack. And Ariados, well, also another great situation for Lyra to be in. Double edge. Now, are you a huge power or a non-huge power? Hard to tell, really. Yeah, Azumarill didn't really become that amazing of a Pokémon until, well, two things. One, gaining a Fairy-type, and two, the fact that, um, that Belly Drum stopped being illegal with Aqua Jet. Because until they changed the breeding mechanics, and I think it's Gen 5 where they changed the mechanics to allow for that, until then, Belly Drum and Aqua Jet were both illegal egg move combinations. You couldn't have both of them at the same time due to the way that egg moves worked. Only the father could pass down moves. But when they changed it, then you could have both of those in the same moveset, and that's when Azumarill became ridiculous. Also, the fairy typing. Because fairy typing almost literally makes anything better. Speaking of which, Gardevoir. Also a case in point. Though, I mean, Gardevoir got a Mega as well. I mean, even non-Mega Gardevoir is still pretty decent, thanks to its fairy typing. I do like they did that, though. It gave it a bit of an edge over Alakazam that it previously kinda lacked. I still think, though, like, okay, okay, this is my big throw was weird, but as far as fairy missed opportunities go, I still think the Lake Trio should have become part fairy. The Lake Trio from Shino. Japanese name, Shino. Um, because all three of them are basically fairy, so... I really wish that they had made them fairies, but they didn't. Yeah, I guess I'll just go for Psychic. Your entire team is just weak to a Psychic type that knows Thunderbolt, isn't it? I feel the need to remind everyone that Light Sweet is still up. Lyra is just that amazing. And uh, speaking of Psychic types, here's Psyche. Anyway, though, this Octillery should hopefully not last too long. Okay, thankfully that Fuse. Because after this, we have one fight, and then we can claim this item, and I think I'll end this part there, because, uh... uh yeah, I probably should, because, um... There are actually two battles on the other path, believe it or not. And then there's two Force fights after that, and there are more Shadow Pokemon uh, there, so... I think I'll just keep the majority of the optional battles just to this part, so that, I don't know, it makes it easier for, you know, I guess if you only want to see the Shadow Pokemon fights, you can quite easily just ignore this part, but I would recommend it because that battle was uh, earlier with the Attract was amazing, and, um... <laughs> it's kind of funny you preempted what I was just saying. Would there finally be a decent battle for Ricky in here, please? So yes, I'm after that chest. I have here on Jargo. What do you have in your jar, I guess? That's not a good thing to have in your jar! Ah. People still insist on using Delibird even late into the game, it seems. And actually, this isn't a bad matchup, so let's go for Crunch, and then let's just uh, short you in the Delibird. Ah, oh, look, Magic Coat, that one move that got completely ruined by an ability that's essentially it, but doesn't take up a move slot. That being Magic Bounce. Although I think there are some Pokemon that still make good use of Magic Coat. I think Porygon 2 learns it. I could be wrong about that, but I seem to remember that Porygon 2 might learn that. But there are some Pokemon that I remember getting decent use out of it. Magic Coat basically just 
is the same as Magic Bounce. It rebounds most non-attacking moves that do really target you. Which includes entry hazards, I think. Because I know that Magic Bounce includes entry hazards. Uh, speaking of which, uh, Swallow, let's... Let's just finish off the... Although, Ricky risks getting hit with a, um, Sludge Ball, but it doesn't really matter. Let's just finish off the Grump Dig. I still wish there was a Shadow Spoink or a Grump Dig in one of these two games, because it seems like another one of those Pokemon that you normally overlook, but in a game with limited options, it might actually be decent of an option. Well, I miss anyway, that's like three misses, and please don't paralyze me! A big blobby poison type using... Okay, good, you can paralyze me. A big blobby poison type using, uh, using Body Slam reminds me of Ash's Muck, which for some reason Body Slam was like Ash's Muck signature move for some reason. Don't really know, I said for some reason twice, but... I don't really know why, but sort of was. Uh, yeah, I'm just gonna double target on that Relic Hand, just because the Swallow is not that much of a priority right now. Its attacking stats aren't that amazing, if I'm remembering right from the bio. Here we go, Sean you can! I just can't resist saying that whenever somebody uses Sky Uppercut, because I mean, Sky Uppercut is pretty much just Shoryuken, and just like, just like, uh, Aura Sphere is like Hadouken. Aura Sphere's Japanese name is not quite Hadouken, it's one syllable off, it's Hador Dan, I think. The Dan being the bomb, which explains why it's blocked with Bulletproof, I think. Bulletproof is just one of those abilities that got majorly lost in translation because almost every move that Bulletproof blocks has done in its name or, or like bomb or bullet in Japanese, but uh, in English most of them don't. Like especially Acid Spray. Acid Spray is a weird one because in Japanese it's called Acid Bomb which explains why it's blocked by Bulletproof, but yeah for some reason they yeah didn't call it that and that caused a um, minor case of I wouldn't call it a dub-induced plot hole, because it's not actually related to the plot, but a dub-induced mechanical confusion. Or, well, possible mechanical confusion. I'm gonna go ahead and use a revive on you, because I want you to get the experience from this. But yeah, that was, um, a bit- of, like, there are so many of those in Pokemon. Like, there are a lot of moves that, that the, the translators thought it was a good idea at the time, but then a later thing is introduced that interacts with it. Like, um, how, like, the pulse moves were never translated consistently until Mega Launcher got introduced, because Aura Sphere is technically a pulse move. Um... Uh, what do I do? Yeah, I think I'll just go for you, because you could potentially, um, do a lot to Labor Team. Let's see, where am I? I've got enough revives, I'm kind of fine for now. Was wondering if I needed to restock those. Yeah, I feel like they should have, like, called them just all aura moves. Like, Dark Pulse could have been Dark Aura. Heal Pulse could have been Healing Aura. And then already translated Water Pulse, but that could have been, like, Aquatic Aura or Water Aura or something. But again, like, like you can't predict that. Like, there was a case of that in the Yu-Gi-Oh card game, I think, as well, where um, they didn't translate, uh, like, the Fiend. Oh, well, they, I think they ended up calling it Arch Fiend, but I think there were demons in Japanese. They didn't translate the term demon consistently originally, so they later introduced a card that specifically boosted demons on the field, and the translators were like, oh no, because Summon Skull was a demon in Japanese, but it's not called demon in English. Uh, like, like, there was so many different, like, that, like, Axe of Despair, I think, was also a demon in Japanese. Uh, and so many things. And then they have it in reverse, too, because there was also, like, a, a card archetype later on that interacted with cards that were called Guardians. And the English version of that card was hilarious, because it, uh, because it said, like, put one Guardian card in your hand, excluding, and then it listed about ten different cards that all had Guardian in their name in the English version, but were not actually Guardians in Japanese. Uh, Celtic Guardian is the most famous, but but there were like so many others. It's like Yellow Baboon Guardian of the Forest, I think was another one or something like that. I mean, I don't follow Yu-Gi-Oh, but I do follow um, um, the um, TV Tropes page on Dub and Juice plot hole, because, you know, as an aspiring translator, I find it uh, very fascinating, those kind of things. But yeah, I, I always found that pretty hilarious. <laughs> 
Put one guardian into your hand, except for this, 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 this. <laughs> but it is a case of, like, very often translators will just translate something in isolation and won't know whether it becomes important later on in a different context or not. It is always an issue with translating. I've, I've talked about the Diamond Dandruff thing with, with Dawn in the anime and how they got extremely lucky when they translated Dawn's nickname. But anyway, what was all that for? That we, that we had to fight through three optional trainers to get? One elixir! Now, if that was a Final Fantasy elixir, then I guess that'd be fine, but Pokemon elixirs, they just restore PP, so... Yeah. I know you can't buy them in stores, but still... I feel like that item is just not worth having to go through all those trainers for, so... If you want my opinion, you can just easily skip those. I think for now, though, I'll end it here, and next time we'll be taking on the correct path through this area, so I'll see you there.